I want to begin by conveying my gratitude to everyone on the conference committee, to Fiona, and, and really everyone who had a hand in bringing me here today, and that includes the folks who made this event possible, the people um, who work the tech behind the presentations, everybody who's served the food and cleaned up after our messes, so thank you all of you for making this happen. So today I'm going to bring you on a journey through my fieldwork experiences. And the road will be a bit arduous, but I promise that there is light at the end. Um, this is going to be challenging, but it's not going to be like one of those archival escape rooms that I heard about earlier. Um, it'd probably be more like the Lego workshop where we're kind of thinking together and building um, ideas and exchanging um, possibilities. So I invite you to hop in the car and join me as we head to Puerto Rico. It's December 1st, 2020. I'm driving my car along Highway 10 through the Karst Mountains of Puerto Rico en route to the Arecibo Ionosphere Observatory, one of many field sites of my dissertation research. I was scheduled to tour the facility's unique data center, which is housed in a Faraday cage to minimize radio frequency interference, or RFI, created by computers and other equipment. The radio free, uh, frequency sensitivity is such that even cell phones are not permitted uh, within the premises because they might interfere with the crucial broadcast equipment involved in research projects like SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, but as I descended into the Karst Valley landscape where the facility is housed, uh, I received a phone call uh, informing me that the unthinkable happened. The collapse of the Arecibo Observatory, long a beacon of international cooperation and research on everything from the atmosphere to extraterrestrial life, was the culmination of decades of infrastructural decay, accelerated by hurricanes Irma, Maria, and the 2020 earthquakes that rocked the island's southern coast. In an instant, the facility's interstellar missives stopped sending. If there were aliens listening to us on distant stars, they could hear our signal dissipate into sudden static. As the facility collapsed, shaking the foundations of homes within a 10 mile radius of the facility. Luckily, I didn't feel it from the safe confines of my car. In 1999, Susan Lay Starr, a scholar and a sociologist, observed that infrastructure seldom becomes visible until it breaks down. Failure or breakdown evaporates the illusion that the infrastructures that we have come to rely on are seamless, automatic, or immaterial. As we, as we have seen in Ireland with the uh, rolling blackouts, infrastructure is often hyper-visibilized when it fails. It becomes more apparent. Laystar's observation feels especially relevant today an age where the digital is so integrated into the fabric of our lives that we can scarcely imagine life without it. Indeed, were it not for digital applications like Zoom to facilitate uh, remote participation, the global economy might have collapsed following the outbreak of COVID-19 and the implementation of lockdowns and quarantines across the world. The word that lay people often use to describe this digital ecosystem is cloud a metaphor for something just short of bursting into precipitation, a catch-all for everything the internet threads through. But where did this metaphor of cloud come from? For answers, I turn to the unlikely place of Irish mythology. Exhumed from a peat bog in the early 20th century, this statue is called the Tangra di Idol and is held in St. Patrick's Cathedral in the town of Armagh. Experts argue that it is a depiction of the great hero and first king of the Tuatha de Danann in Irish mythology, dating as far back as 1000 BCE. Nuada Airgetram, according to some etymologists, the name means he who brings mist, or alternatively, cloud maker. Nuada was a powerful warrior and is said to have lost his arm in a great battle defending his kingdom. The key to his success on the battlefield was his enchanted weapon, a sword called Fragarak, which when pressed against the neck of his enemies would compel them to provide whatever information he desired of them. 
Fragarak, translated to English, is something like answerer. For this cloud-born hero, information, rather than martial prowess, was crucial for the survival of the first dynasty. Today, we don't need to wield the answerer to acquire information, because the cloud provides that which we are seeking. All we have to do is ask it, and it will provide. The information we request, write symphonies, generate paintings, or narrate our personal histories with a penchant for exaggeration and fabulation that makes uh, the most outlandish hero myths sound reasonable. The tangle of infrastructures we call cloud is a fiction of convenience without consequence, a fantasy of infinite space and immateriality obscured by the labyrinth of fiber optics, data centers, cellular towers, satellites, and computers that stitch it together at the speed of light. As this artistic rendering um, illustrates, cloud is nebulous, defined, and nearly impossible to imagine because where it begins and where it ends is unclear. It is in our homes, on our screens, above our heads, and below our feet. I define cloud as a global network of remote computational power and storage capacity, a nesting of infrastructures that includes fiber optics, data centers, satellites, cell towers, and our personal devices. But there's more to the cloud than the gadgets that make it up. Digital application hiccups like the one depicted here with the message server unavailable that I'm sure everybody here has seen remind us that as sophisticated as these systems are, they are imperfect, contingent, and fragile. But for me, as an anthropologist of the cloud, these moments of rupture are interesting because they reinforce the idea that technology is relentlessly human. For every server timed out message you receive, there is a human story, a story of human beings doing their best and stumbling along the way, a story of machines and, man and their maintainers. There are people in the cloud. Since 2016, I have ethnographically studied the cloud and its largely unseen stewards, these unsung heroes and scrappy technicians that keep the digital afloat and grapple continuously with its weighty presence throughout the world. My research method is called ethnography, which simply stated is an approach to learning based on the deep cultivation of relationships with people. In some ways, Libraries and data centers bear a striking resemblance as storage facilities for information. But upon closer inspection, that comparison evaporates. The securitized perimeters of data centers make them more like fortresses than libraries, as this robotic dog deployed in a Utah data center reveals. As such, the ethos of a public commons that guides many of you here today as librarians is very different from the lives of the technicians that I study who operate under a capitalist system geared toward profit and customer satisfaction above all else. In my dissertation, I track how this ethos of capitalism leads to a fundamental unsustainability. The cloud, as I have come to know it, is an ecological force. Its environmental impacts are multiple and varied, and as Rebecca's keynote reminds us, local in scope and scale. And what follows, I share stories from my field work to illustrate some of these harms and point towards some solutions that might avert the climate crisis we find ourselves in. This is Tom. He's a ruddy-faced, 50-something-year-old Irish-American with a big personality. And I met him in Boston, and I spent a lot of time with him running around data centers, tidying up cables, um, pulling up floor tiles, decommissioning servers, and his most favorite task, which is hunting for unseen vermin. He likes to, he has a sort of method to his madness. You know, he uses his senses. He likes to hear the sounds and the signatures of this vermin. Um, and one of the things that he finds is that there's a certain noise that fans make when the vermin is near. And at, fir at first, I thought that he was referring to these electric squirrels that have downed data centers and um, in a Yahoo data center in 2008, uh, infamously, um, or rats or other kinds of pests that you find crawling around these places, um, or the mythical rachosaur, which is where I, the name of Carbonivorous came from. 
But for Tom, the vermin has a different kind of nature altogether. The vermin is heat. These aren't rabbits. They're hot spots. For data center technicians, the hot spot is the ultimate foil. It is the threat to, to digital civilization. And these technicians see themselves as the hunters that keep us afloat and keep us safe from thermal runaway. For Tom, he trusts more his senses, his, his hearing, his sense of touch, um, than he does computational models like this one that depict the movement of air and the thermal dynamics within a facility like a data center. Um, and the reason for that is that the cost of downtime as a result of a thermal outage is so high that many technicians will lose their job if they're found to be responsible. Heat has been a uh, significant um, force in, in data centers lately, and the most notably uh, in London, the Oracle data centers were knocked out by the um, heat wave that swept over Europe last year. So technicians like Tom, that, the technicians that I followed like Tom, they need to stop thermal outages from occurring. And they do that by adjusting the air conditioning as needed, prying open floor tiles to increase airflow to electronics, and patrolling the halls of data centers for any signs of distress. What they are not doing is thinking about sustainability in the sense that we all are today. <laughs> sustainability for them is making sure that uptime occurs, that that server outage window doesn't appear. And for the most part, they are very successful, remarkably so. Um, the figures for uptime range from 99 point something percent to 99 point something percent, which is pretty remarkable, even across the different tiers of data centers. But that, that success comes at a great cost, a great material cost. The average data center consumes as much electricity as 50,000 homes, which is the equivalent of a small city um, at 220 to 320 terawatt hours annually, data centers as a whole consume more electricity than some countries. Data centers and their transmission networks um, and really everything that's connected to the, uh, what we call ICTs uh, emit what's the equivalent of 1.5% to 2% of global greenhouse gas emissions per the International Energy Agency. The reason for this is that most of the electricity drawn from by the cloud services and data centers and computers comes from electricity that is sourced from fossil fuels. Every day, 70% of the world's internet traffic passes through Loudoun County, Virginia, a place nicknamed Data Center Alley, because it is the world's largest cluster of data centers and among the least sustainable. While many data center companies and big tech companies have pledged to decarbonize their data center operations by as soon as 2025 or 2030, in some instance, um, Dominion Energy, the regional electricity provider uh, for, for this particular region, continues to invest in fossil fuel pipelines and fracked gas to generate electricity, rather than committing to renewables like on the scale necessary for total decarbonization per the UN IPCC guidelines. One solution that folks have explored in this industry is harnessing the planet as a kind of natural cooling system. Um, media scholar Ostevandero calls this infrastructuring the air. We've seen this here in Ireland and in places not so far, in um, Iceland and Nordic countries, where the year-round cool climate is used as a kind of natural air conditioner for computing. The idea is that we could achieve um, a, a lower carbon footprint by kind of taking advantage of the natural affordances of the planet. But due to signal latency issues and limited grid capacities, moving the cloud to Iceland is not really possible on the scale of the global uh, storage needs. And another way that data center companies can achieve their, uh, to reduce their carbon footprint is by offsetting. And in this case, the offsetting can be quite literal. As we can see here, 
Um, Patrick Brody, a scholar of data centers in Ireland, reminds us <laughs> that um, carbon offsets, which are mostly uh, sourced from purchasing uh, wind credits and other things, so in the case of Amazon Web Service, Invis Energy, um, has resulted in a destabilization of the peat bogs, uh, result dislodging thousands of tons of peat and trees in Donegal, uh, which has contaminated local water supplies and disrupted the habitats of salmon and other animals in the area. Another solution is to put the data centers in the unlikely home of the desert, where it is on average 46 degrees Celsius when I um, go out to visit these shipping containers turned, um, da uh, turned into data centers uh, in this area. So I accompany a data center technician called Eric, who has nicknamed this shipping container the mouth. And I soon learn why. It is miserably hot and wet inside of this place. And the method of cooling is the use of a filter media that mimics kind of how we perspire and sweat. It maximizes cooling efficiency, as, you, as depicted here, through these foamy-like material that, um, that perspire and cool evaporatively or adiabatically uh, to, to more energy efficiently cool the data center. But there is a cost to that as well. While it has significantly reduced the um, carbon emissions associated with uh, air conditioning, the, the water footprint of these, um, uh, of these methods is extremely high. So as high as 20% of the data centers that use these methods um, are sited in vulnerable drought-stricken watersheds, according to a Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory st study. And what, is, um, what remains a mystery to mo is the precise quantity of water that data centers use to cool their facilities. The average hyperscale data center per one study is thought to use 1.7 million liters of water per day to operate. In Bluffdale, Utah, a National Security um, Administration data center in the US has been known to guzzle as much as 5 million gallons of water to cool each day. And this water, like our water, has to be filtered um, to avoid the corrosive particulates that might build up on equipment. Water is, all, is part of computational, the computational metabolism that I'm sketching in my dissertation. Um, a recent study that has just come out has revealed that a, for every 50 questions answered by ChatGPT, about anywhere from 500 to uh, 1,000 milliliters of water are consumed for um, com computational cooling. This, these water politics have resulted in a dynamic wherein, in Valencia, New Mexico, farmers are competing directly with servers for access to water resources. In this same region of Chandler, Arizona, I spent a year interviewing residents who were terrorized by the hum of data centers in their neighborhoods. For the residents of Chandler, the unceasing whir of air handlers and diesel generators uh, required to power and cool the cloud are a constant disruptive presence in their lives. Unlike other industries, the digital does not sleep. Uh, it runs 24-7, 365. And the residents who live in its proximity have claimed to experience symptoms of insomnia, anxiety, hypertension, and depression as a result of prolonged exposure to this noise pollution. This word cloud illustrates some of the more common responses in my interviews. Uh, the larger, the larger um, words are more frequently occurring, whereas the smaller ones are more idiosyncratic. This issue is not confined to Chandler, Arizona. It's, um, it's spreading throughout the US to parts of Appalachia, Chicago, and Northern Virginia, where residents are increasingly become, becoming organized to protest data center noise and oppose the construction of new facilities. Since I left Chandler, uh, I've been in touch with folks in other communities, as well as here in Ireland, who are experiencing data center noise pollution and um, are seeking remediation against the tech companies behind these facilities. But the cloud's veracity does not end with water, electricity, or noise. There is also a material footprint. And I have firsthand experience with this as somebody who 
um, was responsible for decommissioning and uh, wiping the drives of defunct servers. These, the computing equipment inside of data centers has a very uh, short lifespan, as many of you know. Um, the, the two to three year life cycle of servers creates a situation where what we have is a revolving um, door of electronic waste. And if we think about the labor conditions in which they are exhumed from the earth, the materials that make up these servers, that should give anyone pause who cares about human rights. The UN estimates that less than 20% of electronic waste is recycled annually. Most of the e-waste ends up in junkyards, like the one depicted here in Ghana, China, or Burundi, and other parts of the global south, where young people and uh, women mostly uh, are salvage what they can of the valuable materials um, through smelting and other means that are very toxic, not only to their, to their bodies, but also the local environment. Last October, I joined a brainstorming session at the UN uh, Economic Development Forum, where we talked about the challenges of digitizing the global south in a rapidly warming world. What we, what we came back to time and time again was this notion that our world is at a crossroads and our planet is in the crosshairs. Uh, to echo UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres' um, uh, proclamation here. And so the question for me as somebody who studies the cloud critically is how do we, how do we get out of this? How do we get out of what seems to be fundamentally unsustainable? One of the things that we talked about at the UN is the increasing frequency of tropical cyclones in the global south as a result of climate change. And as we know, 92% of the excess emissions per the UN IPCC report are, can be attributed to the global north. And so it, we, there's a sort of irony wherein the global north is responsible for most of the planetary um, damage, and yet uh, the global south and the tropical belt are experiencing the brunt of its effects. In the 19th century, social theorist Karl Marx famously coined the term metabolic rift to describe the fundamental unsustainability of capitalism as evidenced by rapid soil depletion from profit-driven agroeconomics. In the same way, I try to think about the cloud as a kind of metabolic rift. So how do we get beyond that? How do we get past it? What I try to do in my dissertation is to highlight the ways that there are some, there are some people within the industry and without, outside of the industry who are thinking differently about what is data storage, who are moving beyond this metabolic computational scheme. And so for starters, I'd like to go to the past and show some examples of clouds that were. One of the first clouds that ever existed um, was in the Andes Mountains over a thousand years ago. The civilization of Tawantin Suyu flourished by creating a sophisticated informatic infrastructure, uh, along with a network of roads uh, sprawled over thousands of kilometers in one of the most extreme landscapes on Earth. They achieved this using fabric computers woven from camelid fibers. The kipu depicted here, relayed meaning through a specialized nomenclature of knots and twists and fabric, deciphered by specialists not unlike today's programmers. They were carried by human runners who traversed over vast distances to communicate vital information across the Imperium. Spooled together, this lattice work of runners' bodies, roads, numbers, and fabrics formed what might be one of the world's first clouds. And this cloud did not have nearly as high of a carbon footprint as ours did, or a water footprint, or any of the other issues that uh, we've discussed here. Further, one of the things that I find very fascinating about technologies like the Kipu is its relative durability compared to our current technology. We have solid state disk drives that have bit rot and uh, um, that really ceased to be useful after about a decade in, in many cases. And, and many of you wonder, 
if future archaeologists or historians will be able to read uh, digital information stored on hard disks. But we can read a quipu that was um, made over a thousand years ago with camelid fibers. That's pretty humbling. But there are plenty of examples in the natural world. I mean, even in, and the most obvious one in libraries is books, right? So, but we also have wood blocks and Cumer uh, Sumerian cuneiform as other examples of highly durable technologies for data storage and um, um, transmission that have uh, virtually no environmental footprint. So now let's talk about the future. For the data center industry, the future is a, is a subject of conversation that is very common um, to find. Uh, speculation is always afoot, and ideas, however outlandish they may seem, are taken seriously. Um, and servers and other uh, cooling equipment are named after planets from Star Wars. So science fiction is always on the minds of these uh, people that I talk to and spend my time with. Singapore is one place where this is, uh, where innovation, like Ireland, because of the constraints of an island nation and its limited infrastructure, its limited grid capacity, has created a situation where the people in this industry are innovating and pioneering new ways to do data storage more efficiently. And that becomes especially difficult in a place with tropical climate, where high humidity and high ambient heat make um, air conditioning and cooling data storage systems incredibly um, costly in terms of electricity and carbon footprint. One experiment that is ongoing is called the Tropical Data Center, which is asking the question, what if we run servers at extremely high temperatures of, say, 38 degrees Celsius um, and conditions of 90% humidity? Will, can they operate? Can they still function? What's the failure rate? What's the trade-off with high failure rate and high replacement rate? versus um, you know, longer, longer duration of time, longer warranty. These are some of the questions that they're asking. But they're also thinking about new designs. They're thinking about challenging the design um, paradigms of computing to think differently about what kinds of uh, atmospheres and conditions are ideal for computers to function in. Other innovative projects are Microsoft's uh, Project Natick experiment in the Orkney Islands, not so far from here where um, they, are, they have deployed a submersible data center using the ocean as a kind of cooling media um, that, and, and eliminating both the water and uh, a kind of carbon footprint associated with these activities. What is not clear, however, is sort of what would be the radiant heat and noise from these facilities and how it might affect local ecologies, marine ecologies. But there are other um, methods being pioneered, like Meta's um, use of mushrooms to consume many of the kinds of waste involved with data center construction. Something a bit more radical might be um, the idea to recycle waste heat in places like um, the RISE Research Institute in Luleå, Sweden, where biogas fuel cells are powering a data center and the, the excess heat that is created from the data center is being used to warm the town. These are um, examples of the present, but, some of, but what I think many people in the industry um, can't quite imagine is what might come next. And there are folks who are challenging this. And for me, I like to turn to speculative fiction. And I'm particularly inspired by the work of Malka Older, who has coined the term speculative resistance to think of a way to break free from these hegemonic ideas that hold us to, to staying with the tried and true and not exploring something different. So over the last decade, a movement of artists, writers, designers, and futurists are using speculative fiction to imagine a world that is better than the one that we have. Um, it's called solar punk. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's named for its colorful aesthetic, its commitment to uh, sustainable energy futures, and, and it's also premised on this radical notion that to imagine anything but a dystopia in our rapidly warming world is a radical and political act. So these days you hear a lot about the Internet of Things, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about the Internet of Plants. So let us consider a future where data is grown 
So instead of servers, living tissues might be the surfaces on which our data is grafted. Strings of ACTGs instead of ones and zeros, like the threads of the Kipu, life's most basic filaments might be twined with the code of our digital heritage. In such a world, you may be your own data steward, a gardener tending to crops that are like memory. Media theorist Mel Hagan calls this coming era of biological and molecular data storage genomic media. One project that concretely tries to explore this is the Grow Your Own Cloud. It's a marriage of engineering and artistic practice that explores the use of living plant tissues as storage devices. Uh, moreover, the project also invites us to think differently about the relationship between the cloud and um, what we call the digital commons, right? So if we think about the history of the internet as a kind of place, a utopic place of information sharing, not unlike the library as a kind of open place devoted to access, and uh, that is, this is a, a way to kind of come back to that. Instead of storing your data in a fortress <laughs> um, at or removed from your immediate surroundings, there could be a future where you can store some of your data, perhaps, in living tissues or in, um, in molecules that you can then actually have control over. And unlike the cloud that we have today, um, molecular data storage does not have nearly the same kinds of ecological requirements in terms of um, carbon footprint and so forth. Uh, the, the, the literal crops are a different story, <laughs> but um, the, the basic technology of molecular data storage is, is something that is actively in development and is people are um, entertaining and, and exploring today. And so I want to close by inviting you all to kind of think with me about what, you know, what is the, what the challenge that we are facing, um, as Rebecca identified yesterday in um, her keynote. The challenge that we are facing uh, with climate change is severe and it affects us all. And the way to get out of it is to not do more of the same. <laughs> but to um, explore new ideas. We have to overcome what I identify as a, a deficit of imagination in our practices um, and in our politics and in our uh, ways of thinking about what information ecologies are. And I think all of you are at the forefront of that in that the library is, has always historically been a place of shared knowledge, of shared resources, the sharing of resources, the pooling of resources for public good. And so what I hope that you take away from this talk is that the cloud is uh, very much not a library, but maybe it could be. And what would that mean for us? Thank you. <laughs>